Hi, so today we're looking at topic uh, 1.1c and these are physiological factors. Um, just a little inspiration that you can watch. This is a, um, a jar opener, so it's a mechanical device that will actually open up the jar. So have a look at this video and it'll give you a good idea of, of some of the things that we need to consider as designers, okay? And that is the fact that over, over time, and we have to consider people's physiological um, abilities over time. So like for instance, older uh, people have sometimes have a harder time opening jars and well, this, this is a mechanical device that somebody designed that will help them do that. So please do watch this and uh, it's, it's not too long, but it's kind of an interesting uh, inspirational um, design. Okay, so let's talk about this. We're talking about, when we're talking about physiological factors, we want to focus on a couple of things. Uh, we want to focus on comfort and fatigue. So comfort is a person's sense of physical or psychological ease. So it's when you feel um, at ease with, with a, uh, some sort of design. And fatigue is a sense of physical or psychological tiredness. Okay, so these two things go hand in hand, and as we're designing, it's something that we need to pay attention to because actually there's times when we want to design for comfort, and then there's times when we, where we uh, don't actually want to design for comfort. And I'll show you some examples of those things. Um, we also want to pay attention to, in our designs, um, you know, uh, biomechanics of people, how their, their um, bodies work, you know, the, how the elbow turns and how the wrist turns and things like that as we're as we're looking at um, um, designing for fatigue and comfort. Okay, so here's an example of comfortable seating. So this is some airport lounge. lounge uh, these are just lounges that are in the Singapore airport, and you can imagine that these are nice and comfortable. Okay, and you can click on this website to, to get some more information about them. But uh, these are meant for people to lounge in. They, they want you to stay there for a while. I mean, not forever, of course. You're not spending, you know, three or four days. But let's say that you have an eight-hour layover. You are jet lagged and you need a, a little nap. Well, these are designed to help you with that. Okay. Now there are times when you don't want that, and so these are an example of of uncomfortable seating. So what the designer here is telling you is that actually I don't want you to be laying down on these. I would like you to spend a little bit of time on them. Maybe you're waiting an hour, maybe you're waiting a half an hour, but what you're not meant to be doing is what this guy's doing, which is to be sleeping on these things, okay? And so they, they you know, design in barriers that make it difficult to lay down and take up an entire row of seats, you know, plus the fact that these are just uncomfortable. So that's an example of designing for discomfort um, where you are actually physically trying to uh, fatigue somebody so that they won't spend time there. And this is a whole company. This uh, website is kind of interesting. And um, you can, you can um, look at their website, and they have all kinds of designs for, for different seats in, in train stations and airports and places like that. Um, and, you know, it's interesting how they design these things. Okay. How does uh, fatigue affect us? Well, when people are stressed or active for extended period of time, fatigue can set in, and uh, fatigue causes user errors. Okay, uh, as we know, um, if you're tired, um, you don't make decisions the same way that if you are alert and not stressed. So stress causes uh, people to have fatigue, and fatigue can cause user errors with things. Okay, so fatigue is not good, generally, not good. Okay. Being fatigued re reduce, reduces your um, reaction time, your awareness of problems, and your sustained attention. Okay, so this is—it's very actually difficult, or it's very dangerous to drive fatigued. Right, uh, fatigued drivers are three times more likely to get into a crash. And so, you can click on this website, and it gives you some idea of uh, fatigue in the workplace. So, have a quick look at that also. So, you know, we can actually create designs that will reduce fatigue. And so this is actually kind of an interesting um, evolution of, of design. So for instance, in, in World War I, uh, the helmets that uh, people would wear were, well, the Americans specifically and British wore something that was similar to this. They wore helmets like this. And these helmets were actually not meant to help you like take a bullet or anything like that. They're actually meant to help uh, to prevent uh, shrapnel from exploding artillery shells, you know, raining down and getting you. So these uh, had a really wide brim and it was meant to, to keep you from getting um, hit by, by uh, like I said, shrapnel. 
Okay, but they were very exhausting to wear over time. Okay, they were heavy, they were made out of uh, steel, and they just, they weren't comfortable, and they caused fatigue over time, so people wouldn't wear them, and then, of course, they would get um, hit by shrapnel. So um, you wanted to change something, and so in World War II, this is a U.S. Army helmet from World War II, you would see that, that actually the, um, it's a more comfortable helmet. Um, it is, you know, these were actually based on a medieval helmet that people used to wear in like, yeah, like medieval times, like knights in shining armor and castles and stuff like that. This is um, a change, so it was redesigned. It was more comfortable. It was also better for uh, protecting you, and, and it caused less fatigue. And then nowadays, you know, um, but it was also very heavy, so it would cause fatigue because of the heaviness of the whole thing. Nowadays, you have a, a modern helmet, um, and modern helmets are light. They allow you to, to breathe. These things got very hot in the sun. This one will not. Um, it also has a lot more protection. And so it's, you're able to wear this a lot longer. You're not taking it off and then risking your life, um, you know, getting hit by, by something in the head. So um, this, this design can reduce fatigue. So this had the most fatigue, less, and the least. Okay, so, and I suppose the, the best design that we could do is get rid of war because then we'd have no fatigue at all caused by war helmets. Okay, here's another example. Um, here's a, a backpack from a long time ago. This is, um, you know, the kind of backpack that you might wear, um, back in the, you know, early part of the 20th century. So in the early 1900s up to, you know, I don't know, probably the 1930s, 40s. Okay. Um, wasn't very comfortable because all of the stress was put on this part of the body right here, right here. So you would have this, you know, pull, pulling down on your shoulders and there's nerves that run through that part of your shoulder and it hurts, right? So the, the straps on this, there was no waist strap to help hold things. So you'd have very heavy pack loads and it would be pulling down on your shoulders and be very painful. So a redesign of that helped to reduce fatigue and you can see that what this does is it kind of hugs around your hips. And what it does is it takes the weight off of your shoulders and puts it around your hips right here. So this, this strap right here is actually, if it's, if it's resting on top of your shoulders, then you're wearing it wrong. Um, but you can wear these types of packs for a lot longer. So um, this is, is an example of, of trying to reduce fatigue for somebody who's hiking. Okay? The other thing that, that um, reduces fatigue is this is a much heavier backpack than this would, would be. Okay, So uh, that's an example of reducing fatigue. Also, I don't know if you see right here, this... Uh, mesh right here is breathable so you don't have a sweaty back whereas this would not have any of that so this has so many features which helps to reduce the fatigue that people um, have while they're wearing it okay so let's talk about biomechanics biomechanics so bio means life and mechanics is is sort of like the movement of life so this is how people move right so there's research and analysis into the mechanics of living organisms. Biomechanics in human factors includes the research into the analysis of mechanics, operation of our muscles, joints, and tendons of, our, of the human body. It also includes force impact on users' joints, repetition, duration, and posture. Okay, so all of those things are studied in the, the science of biomechanics. This is uh, an example of how you can gather data on biomechanics. And so what they do is they fit... Um, you know, little, um, usually little um, balls of uh, like a, on, on people at their joints and they will film people. It's, it's kind of an interesting video. So please do watch this uh, video and it shows you how, how the data is gathered for um, analysis by biomechanics. Okay, talk about, let's talk about muscle strength. So this is another issue that happens with people is that over time, your ability to Your ability to um, use your muscle, have as much muscle strength as other times reduces. So as, you know, when you're, when you're very young, of course, you're not very strong. But um, as you get into your adult life, you know, your uh, muscle strength will peak and then it will, it will drop off. Okay? And um, this is something that, that happens to, you know, a lot of people. And you need to um, think about this as you're designing things. Okay? So over time, you need to think, okay, well, you know, if I'm designing something for 
uh, younger people um, or you know young adults or you know late teens, they're going to be at their strongest at that point, and so they will be able to um, actually um, be you know you can you can have things that are more take more muscle strength to manipulate. But as you're designing for older people, you would want to reduce that. Okay, um, how one of the ways that we can reduce that is by using something called mechanical advantage. And so this is basically a couple of things. It, it is reduction of force by a tool or a machine, um, and then or the change of direction of a force. Okay, so you know, for instance, you know, this guy could not pick up this rock by himself, but if he's using a lever, here's the fulcrum, here's the lever, uh, here's the load, here's the effort. You know, he's able to move this rock based on uh, mechanical advantage of a lever. Okay. So this is something that we can pay attention to when we're, we're uh, designing. So, you know, just a quick example of this is uh, a door handle. So, for instance, the door handles like this. This has got quite a long door handle, you can see. Um, this door handle is easier to open because it's got a full-size door handle than a door handle like this, which is quite small. You can see that my, uh, my full hand fits on this door handle, but on this door handle, you know, basically I've got three fingers on it. And this door is more difficult to open because of something called torque. Okay, I get more torque from this than I do this. And essentially, uh, you get greater torque from, this is actually a wheel and axle, this whole thing. This is the axle right here, this part right here. And this is like just a part of the wheel. You have to imagine that if, if it was a full wheel, it would come all the way around. They've essentially cut out most of the wheel and just left this strip in here. And the bigger a wheel is, the easier it is to turn the axle. So this is a smaller wheel uh, on the same size axle. So it's harder to open that because you have less torque. Okay, you can see the same thing here. This is torque in a glass jar opener. So you can see here that you know you would take this and put it around the lid of a jar, squeeze on this side, and it's going to give you more torque because you're not just grabbing from the top of the lid. You're grabbing from something else. And here's a couple other examples of those. The Hamilton Beach one again. And here's another jar opener that allows you to increase your torque and therefore having a mechanical advantage when you're opening up those jars. So I'm using torque here as an example of why you need to design and think about muscle, muscle strength over time. Now, you know, for, for people who are young adults, you know, uh, they probably are not going to need a device to help them open a jar but if you are say you know in your um, old age in your older life that's something that you might might need um, because you wouldn't have the strength to actually open the jar all right and I think that's it thanks for watching